We've had a long, hot summer in America. It culminated in a tragic August day in Charlottesville, Virginia, when an act of domestic terror took an innocent life and exposed the race hatred simmering under the surface of the United States. A Unite the Right alt-right event brought hundreds of white nationalists to the streets of Charlottesville proclaiming white supremacy and anti-Semitism, waving Confederate flags and brandishing Nazi symbols as they protested the removal of a statue of Confederate General Robert E. Lee. Have we forgotten our history? Are we confused about what this country is supposed to stand for? Why are we still fighting the Civil War? Joining us for a discussion of what's really going on in America is award-winning columnist Tony Norman, who has written extensively about these issues for the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Tony Norman, great to have you. Good to be here, Paul. Why are we still fighting the Civil War? Well, um, the place of race in American life is one that um, we fought a war to settle, and it didn't quite settle it. Um, to be perfectly honest, uh, when the war ended in 1865, that was really just the end of the first major skirmish. For the next hundred years or so, until the Civil Rights Acts and the Voting Rights Acts of the mid-1960s, um, the war had taken a different form called Jim Crow. And we're just coming out from underneath the struggle to ensure basic rights for all Americans, uh, all non-white Americans, which had not been a guarantee until the mid-60s. And today, we're dealing with the echoes of the resentments uh, that came about as a result of the freedom movements, the civil rights movements, and all the various movements that came out of that. And so you ask, why uh, are we still fighting the Civil War? Um, I think it has a lot to do with the, the nature of, of, of Americans. We just can't bear to really settle these issues definitively. We can't really talk about these things with each other without screaming at each other. And I think there's a specter of guilt and uh, a specter of, well, if I admit, if I say I'm sorry, or if I give any ground to this person over here, then uh, that reduces um, my own uh, morality in my own eyes. So I think it's a very complicated thing uh, in America. What are the resentments that you say that exist? Who, who was resenting what? Well, I think it's pretty clear that whenever the conversation goes to, let's say, slavery mm -hmm. in, in American life, and, and you know, the part it played, uh, the denial of slavery's importance to American history uh, is a sign uh, that there is uh, some major discomfort about owning that dark part of our history, as if it's going to just sort of like isolate one particular people out for, let's say, um, uh, um, approbation or something. You know, it's not just a matter of making white people feel bad to acknowledge that something called slavery happened. It's just getting the historical record right. It's like the folks who say, well, you know, the Civil War was never about slavery. And saying that the Civil War was not about slavery somehow means that uh, the United States is a good place because we may have had slaves, but we took care of them. That is not only insulting, but it's ahistorical. And that's the mentality of a lot of people who feel that, um, you know, that the, the, the war of northern aggression, as they call it, um, is, is, you know, ha was never really settled to their satisfaction. Why is it that so many Americans are hanging on or want to hang on to the symbols of the Civil War? You see in places, we are here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. in Pennsylvania, even not only in this state, but in this city, yeah. you see people flying Confederate flags or they yeah. have Confederate flag license plates. Sure. You see it in Ohio. Mm -hmm. These are states that fought for the Union. Mm -hmm. We are the descendants of men who died yeah. fighting for the Union. Mm -hmm. 
And yet we're seeing these symbols here in a part of the country where presumably you would not. What, what's going on? You know, borders are fungible, attitudes are fungible too. I mean, there are people who, who may have been from pure, who may be from pure Yankee stock, who just feel sympathetic to the, the Southern cause. Uh, and a lot of it boils down to just pure racism. Um, you know, it's not that the North was some virgin forest of egalitarianism, um, you know, before and after the war. The most egregious examples of Jim Crow happened as much in the North as in the South during that 100-year period up until 1965, 66. The reason that the, the attitudes are beginning to harden is that the people who remember Jim Crow. I mean, you and I are old enough to remember just the tiniest, mm -hmm. you know, um, the tiniest signs of it. I mean, I remember as a, as a child going to um, North and South Carolina, where I have family, and seeing the residue of the colors only signs above the bathrooms on the side and the whites only fountains. You could see the the shadows of those things, um, they weren't completely removed or had only recently been removed. So you and I know that at once upon a time there was a period where you and I could not sit on a sofa like we are right now and have a conversation. There are many, many people being, you know, who are alive today who don't remember that or just like Holocaust deniers feel that it's, it's just been overstated or no, no, that couldn't have happened. We live in a period of, of more information than there's ever been, but more disinformation and more misinformation. And uh, unfortunately, there are a lot of people who just buy into um, racist stuff, to use a more polite word than one I really want to use. You, you mentioned the, the Nazis and, um, and the Holocaust, and there is an ownership in mm -hmm. Germany Absolutely. of the Holocaust. There are very few places you can go where you don't see some mm -hmm. memorial. Right. Uh, they have owned their history, as unsavory as mm -hmm. it is. We seem not to have done that no. in we America. We have valorized. We have or valorized. revised it yeah. to the point where, where somebody like General Lee mm -hmm. yes, is a hero. Is a hero right. or, and, and, or Stonewall Jackson is considered mm -hmm. to be a hero. Right. Because we've decoupled it from the issue of slavery because they were fighting um, for the right of the Confederacy to, um, to self-govern and they were breaking away from the oppressive government you know, of the North. And so, um, yeah, and so if you decouple um, what they did, what they were truly fighting f um, for from you know, um, slavery, then you can have all sorts of, you can talk about the nobility of Robert E. Lee, you can talk about the nobility of Stonewall Jackson and whether they were good generals or not or, or fought valiantly. Um, but if you see it in the context of what um, the regime was that they were fighting to um, protect and extend, well, then you have a different opinion of them. And so it really does boil down to, um, to what, what degree of self-deception um, is a person willing to indulge? Are they willing to say, yes, um, these statues that, are, that were erected mostly in the 1920s, um, some during the 1950s during the Civil Rights Movement. But these statues, these monuments to these Confederate generals represent pure and simple honor and valor in the abstract. If you are willing to, to say that's what they're all about, then sure, I can see why you're out there defending those statues. But if you have even a, a, a you know, satana, is that the word? Scintilla? <laughs> scintilla, not centena, scintilla of historical um, memory, then you know what the deal is. In the United States, Nazis, neo-Nazis, <clears throat> KKK members, white supremacists, they all have a right to mm -hmm. assemble. Mm -hmm. They have a right of free speech. Mm -hmm. But should we look at maybe 
adjusting the First Amendment because it protects free speech, but it's also seemingly protecting hate speech. To be perfectly honest, I would not be one of the people ringing the bells for adjusting the First Amendment. I think that um, it is um, probably our best defense against hate speech. Uh, it's our best defense against um, government tyranny. Uh, so I would be loath to, to, to touch it. Having said that, I think a part of the First Amendment also, there's an educational component that I think the media and I think our schools have failed at. You can't have masses of people walking around believing, let's say, the Holocaust didn't happen, or that the earth is flat, or that white people are, are you know, superior to black people um, by right. We have to rely upon the collective wisdom and goodwill of the American people to police our own stuff. And we just haven't done a very good job of that. So you see all sorts of ignorance and fake news uh, out there. And some of the biggest fake news of all is that, you know, um, that white people are the oppressed minority in America. It just beggars the imagination how there are people who truly believe that. I can only imagine, you know, what it must be like for an African American man to watch what's going on in some places, to watch, you know, a KKK or a white supremacist group marching and, you know, it's, it's like the, uh, it's like what it is like for Jews or, or you know, right. it has been like in places mm -hmm. like Skokie, Illinois, right. where the Nazis are, you know, guaranteed uh, by the, you know, the Civil Liberties Union mm -hmm. will, or excuse me, the, uh, the American Civil, American Liberties, Civil Union. Liberties Union will step in and, and say, well, you know, this is, this is, this is, this speech you know, as hideous as it may be, is guaranteed under the Constitution. And what they're doing is they're telling Jewish people that they belong back in concentration camps right. or extermination camps. And 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 for for black people, it it's you. What they're yeah. saying is back to the plantation. Yeah. And and yeah. Uh, so you're you're asking how, how I what's mean, it like saying, for you? You know, it's 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 really interesting. Face to face, you know. Even evil people have the capacity to be polite. They'll be very polite when they're, when they're in a one-on-one -on -one engagement with you. But collectively, when you see them with their placards and their hoods the and mob actually psychology in the street, changes that. Exactly. And, and they become a real threat to your existence. All you have to do is be around them at the wrong time and there are no police. Order would break down if they could get away with it. And so... To see it is to be reminded that our society has a long way to go in terms of racial, true, deep, and abiding racial reconciliation. That idea just sort of intimidates and horrifies people. The idea of just sort of like an honest reckoning with American history, which is why people in America hate history. We're the most ahistorical people on the planet. I think the only thing that we hate worse than um, history is geography. And, you know, and we learn our geography by whatever the latest war is that we're involved mm. in. Other than that, we hate history because it implies um, that things are cyclical and that there's going to be a reckoning and that the things that we thought were just dead and buried in the past really continue to bubble up. We hate that notion. We, we like things to be clean, straight on. History is just an arrow that goes forward, and there's never a reckoning for uh, any of our actions. So we get to be eternally innocent in that way. Hmm. Do you ever envision a time when we will achieve a post-racial society in America? I think, yes, I think we will get there. I think it will be in... Uh, in my sons, it'll be in their children's generation. Um, my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren uh, will begin to see the beginnings of that. I think you, just a generation of people have to die. Our generation has to die. Our parents' generation has to die because that is where the seeds, you know, of this sort of, um, this, this, this race, of this polite racism is. I mean, 
we've all been socialized to be polite racists. We're, we're no longer the, the badass racists, you know, of, of the early 1900s or the late 1800s and, and the mid-1800s. We're now the polite racists, the scientific racists, the people who feel uh, that Negrophobia is a, a reasonable racism. And so we still live in that era where people have just learned to sublimate their hatred in public. And so uh, when our generation dies and the generations behind us, um, or yeah, the generations coming up, our sons and grandsons and granddaughters and great granddaughters, you know, they will begin to see the, 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 how truly ridiculous it is. Just like, you know, we look at what happened to the witches of Salem and say, mm -hmm. how could intelligent people ever have thought that? But in the meantime, we have these things that are holding us back as a nation. So uh, what has to happen for race relations in this country to improve, mm. even if it's not going to get to post-racial in our lifetimes or even if I got you, if I understood you clearly, even in the lifetime of your sons. Yeah, I, I think that there will be a reckoning in the sense that people will be more willing to discuss these things as more and more absurd things happen. And I think the, the one good what, thing... What, 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 what's it going to take? I mean, we've seen some pretty absurd things. I mean, what happened in Charlottesville yeah. was pretty absurd. Uh, yeah, I think, I think you'll see more things along those lines, and, and maybe even a couple elections that, that go to, you know, really extreme characters who will then force... More extreme than Donald Trump. Yeah, who will then force the conversation in ways that are really uncomfortable for our society, because uh, we really have to get our values aligned. Right now, most people don't vote, most people don't participate in civic, uh, in civic life, uh, most people don't care or understand it. Why are we so disengaged? Well, a lot of it has to do with the fact that we allow our elites and the smart ones among us to run everything. And, um, and we just check out as long as we get a paycheck, that's fine. And a lot of folks feel they were, they'd rather just be blue collar you know, humps and, and just mind their own business and leave the running of the country to those people over there who know what they're talking about, you know, they don't feel a, a sense of, of ownership of their own government. But, we, but, but when did that change? Because there, I think I can remember even in my lifetime when people did not feel that, that sort of disconnected, you know, laissez-faire right. attitude about things. For me, I, I think I started to notice a, a shift, that we can call it that, during the Carter versus Reagan fight for the White House, I couldn't believe that people weren't engaged in that. That seemed to be like such a consequential presidential race and that no one seemed to care about it as much as I did. And I, and I remember, you know, just really struggling with all of those issues that were raised in the, you know, 1979, 1980 political season. And, and, and I couldn't understand why people weren't equally engaged. And, and I think that, you know, the whole seduction by a benign conservative papa, Reagan, made people just sort of relax their guard and their sense of responsibility and engagement. They just sort of believed all sorts of fairy tales because it was convenient. And I think our politics is, has not really recovered. President Trump says if you take down statues of Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson, that you're going down this dangerous path, that, hmm. it, that if you can do that, then you can justify taking down statues of Washington and Jefferson because they owned slaves. Yeah. What about that whole slippery slope argument? Yes, they were pr problematic. They were slave owners, but they understood the contradictions of their position as advocates of liberty and the fact that they had these slaves and they tried to work it out. They understood there was a contradiction in liberty and the seeds of liberation, that the, the, the points that Abraham Lincoln pointed to later on uh, in, in, in 1861 and 1862 
uh, were there in the Constitution, uh, the Constitution that Jefferson uh, and all of the founding fathers uh, labored over. The seeds for the destruction of slavery were right there. So um, I can justify, and I think most people can justify, feeling uh, a deep appreciation uh, for those men, the founding fathers, that they don't feel for the folks who were fighting to resist that liberation, uh, the, the equality that was guaranteed to all people, all Americans. And Robert E. Lee, whatever his personal um, virtue may have been, and I understand he was a very virtuous uh, soldier and so forth, he was still fighting for uh, the right to enslave other human beings. And that is the difference between you know, Washington and Jefferson and the Founding Fathers who were fighting for liberty and were uncomfortable in many ways with the implications of that liberty, but they were still fighting for liberty versus people who were fighting very specifically to deny liberty to a specific group of people. How should the president, in this case, Donald Trump, how should he lead on this issue? The president is, first and foremost, supposed to embody you know, all of the virtues and all of the, the idealism of the American people in some way. And it may not even be fair to put so much on one person, but you have to be uh, a symbol uh, of, the, um, of the country's ideals on some level. You have to be able to, if not be a symbol, at least articulate those ideals and at least know what they are. And this is a transactional president. This is a president who sees what he can do in the moment. He's our first existentialist president. You know, he lives moment to moment. He has no past, no future. Only the moment exists, uh, the right now. And when you're in the right now and you're just sort of cut off from any sort of uh, source of, of, of moral integrity and so forth, you basically have someone who's just there to make deals. And I don't think he's ever going to see a deal worth making that involves um, treating all Americans equally. I think he, he sees being the President of the United States as an opportunity to, first of all, enhance his own situation personally and his families, and then maybe third or fourth, the American people. The Republic will survive Donald Trump. I mean, at the most, he's there for eight years, and then he's gone. And then we can get back to the business of trying to uh, reconcile the disparate factions of the American people in a way and, and have someone in that office who truly cares to do it. He's not someone who cares to do it. And I don't think there's anything someone like that can do uh, to, um, to make things right if he doesn't want to. When you look back to the 2016 election, you, you, I remember you were, you were certain Hillary Clinton was right, going to I was, win. Right, I was one of the false prophets. And, and now you're saying, well, he may be in for eight years. Right, because what, I, what, I what, my did, what did you, what, 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 what was that lesson? Uh, never underestimate, A, the, um, the ability of the American people to vote against their best interests. Uh, and that includes um, working class whites, that includes women, that includes um, minorities who don't go to the polls like they should. Uh, it includes all the majority of Americans who choose not to even vote. Um, I always had this idealistic notion that people, if they're conf you know, given a clear, um, choice, uh, anarchy, you know, and destruction of, of American life, you know, or simply exerting a little bit of will to go to the polls to ensure liberty. They would choose the thing that would ensure their own um, betterment. I am no longer under that impression. I think that 
that Americans are essentially um, indifferent until something horrible happens. And whether it's a civil war, whether it's a second war, world war, whether it's Vietnam or whatever, we need some sort of catharsis to do the right thing. Um, and, and in many ways, you know, Trump will probably provide that and we probably will start caring about these things again, but right now we don't. And so if he's able to skate through his first term without, you know, nuking North Korea, let's say, whatever, um, people love him. They'll turn out to do the polls and, and reelect him. The people who don't love him, the people who hate him, they like the protests, but they don't necessarily vote. And that's, that's the frustration. As you said earlier, there was a time when you and I couldn't sit on this couch together and have, a, mm -hmm. and have the conversation we're having. But we are. And, in, and even in this city where there seems to be, uh, here in Pittsburgh, yeah. uh, uh, a problematic uh, racial isolation, yeah. you still see, you know, walking on these streets in downtown mm -hmm. Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. black and white people yeah. together, yeah. working together, mm -hmm. uh, going to school together. Yeah. Uh, you know, and in, and in this city of sports, mm -hmm. uh, iconic sharing sports together. legends, yeah. sharing that, leg, yeah. you know, white and black athletes yeah. contributing together. Yeah. So, uh, you know, can't, w w can't that lead to something positive? Oh, it could. And, and, it, and it probably will eventually. And I, and I think that those are good signs. And I am not one of those people who says that there hasn't been any progress. It's been a lot of progress. Uh, there just hasn't been enough. Clearly, there has not been. And, and I think that that's, I would be prepared to say that, um, you know, we'll never achieve racial utopia in America, period. Um, but we can achieve equality, and we can achieve a certain amount, you know, uh, the lessening of institutional um, uh, bigotry, prejudice, racism. And, and giving everyone uh, equal opportunities and equal access to everything. And, and that's really what this fight is about. It's not so much as like, oh, you know, we must absolutely have 50%, you know, every classroom has to be half black and half white or third black or third white, third Hispanic and so forth and so on. No, 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 we don't need that. What, 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 we, what we need are schools that educate all kids, you know, with um, superior teachers. That's what I think the civil rights movement is really all about. Not so much as black kids and white kids sitting next to each other, because that doesn't really mean anything as far as I know. Um, but I really want access to the same good teachers that you have, you know, you know as, a, as, a, as a white student. And, and that is really the, the issue. And I think that once you have that, the social integration comes. So that at the end of the day, it really comes down to equal opportunity yes. as opposed to uh, you know, the complete integration of society. I, I think a complete integration of society would be the ideal. I don't think it comes when you just sort of like force people together. I think you have to show people that it's in their interest to be an integrated society. We're a long way from that. We just watched the Emmys and it was like, wow, you know, all of a sudden, you know, you see minorities being recognized, but you know, behind the scenes, it's still the same situation. So power, you know, has the ability to like throw out a couple winners here and there, um, but it still isn't giving anything up. And I think that we need to get to the point where people in power are willing to share that power with people who don't look like them. And that's when you'll begin to see America fulfill its destiny. Tony Norman is a columnist for the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, an award-winning columnist, and uh, he has been my guest. Tony, as always, it's a pleasure, and thank you for sharing your insights. All really right, Paul, it. good being here, man.